Even in its seventh season, HBO's epic fantasy series, Game of Thrones, is one of the most talked about shows on television. Dazzling international audiences with their action-packed battle sequences, steamy romances, jaw-dropping twists of fate, and of course, the dragons. In fact, the only thing this show doesn't offer up is disappointment. Hi, I'm Adrian with Cinematica, and fresh off the tail of the latest season, we thought we'd give fans even more Game of Thrones goodness, with 107 facts about Game of Thrones Season 7. Oh, and consider this a spoiler warning. Let's get started. The season premiere was delayed a few months, premiering in the summer instead of its typical April time slot. The reasoning? Since winter finally arrived in Westeros, the showrunners decided to film during fall to utilize the dead look of the season. The new deadline also resulted in a shorter than usual season, with only 7 episodes announced instead of the usual 10. It was also announced that season 7 would hold the new record-breaking episodes of the series, containing both the shortest and the longest episode of the entire series. The Spoils of War is the shortest at just 50 minutes, while the season finale is said to be 79 pretty close to a feature film. To avoid the shifty paparazzi from releasing any spoilers, fake scenes were actually filmed to throw them off. In total, the crew shot up to 15 hours worth of fake footage. The end of season 6 made one thing clear, that winter had arrived in Westeros. And the actors knew that this meant they'd be working with the dreaded snow machines. Apparently when you work with fake snow, you eat a lot of fake snow. While some actors battled it out with the snow machines, others were transported to freezing cold areas like Belfast and Iceland, where the weather dropped as low as negative 27 degrees Celsius at one point. This season also features many wardrobe improvements and additions. Jacob Anderson, who plays the Unsullied leader Grey Worm, says his old costume was made of such heavy leather that he actually has scars from that tunic. Chief costumer Michelle Clapton revealed that the Night's Watch characters are actually dressed in Ikea rugs. After the announcement, it didn't take long for Ikea to post how-to instructions on building your own Night's Watch cloak. Showrunners D.B. Weiss and David Benioff announced that along with the shortened season, there would be an accelerated pace in the storytelling this year. That's because for the first time in the series, all of the key players are finally coming together. Since all of the characters who have yet to cross paths are now crossing paths in the same continent, fans were previously told to expect most of the stories to start colliding this season. The season premiere's shocking cold open featuring the celebratory feast at Walder Frey's house wasn't originally the opening scene in the script. When the show's creators, D.B. Weiss and David Benioff, saw the subtle nuances that actor David Bradley instilled in his performance to show that Walder Frey was actually Arya Stark in disguise, they knew it would make for a much stronger opening. One of Weiss's favorite scenes in the first episode was when the Hound saw the remains of the little girl and farmer he left for dead in season 4. Apparently, the two almost starved to death before giving up and committing suicide. The burial scene in that episode marks a key moment for the Hound, in which we see just how much he's changed over time. The fact that he buries the remains of the farmer and his daughter shows that he feels guilty for his actions and responsible for their deaths. Samuel Tarly discovers that Maester training isn't all it's cracked up to be when he's assigned the gross task of cleaning chamber pots. Apparently, wet fruitcake was used to create the look of the human feces for the chamber pot scene. That scene was amazing and gross. And comment down below if you thought the same. According to John Bradley, this sequence was shot over a period of five days. He was also stuck filming alone while the rest of the cast were in LA for the Emmys. During John's speech in the Great Hall, the camera focuses on a few specific characters in the crowd as they eye each other in silence or self-reflect. This was the editor's way of putting emphasis on the exact people who relate to John's message personally. With Tommen's death last season, Cersei has nothing to lose now that her children are gone. The writers claim that nothing will stop her from winning, and that's really what makes Cersei a force to be reckoned with. The outfit Sansa is wearing was created for this season specifically to represent the character's growing strength. Designer Michelle Clapton wanted to reflect on the character's past trauma, so she created a tightly woven outfit that says no one can ever get close. Because the outfit symbolizes Sansa embracing her own past, you may notice little details that are connected to her history, even down to the dress pattern. The stitching resembles fish swimming, as an ode to her mother, who was a Tully. Returning home is a huge game changer for Daenerys, and the writers felt that adding dialogue to her homecoming scene would only take away from that moment. Instead, they have all of her followers give her ample distance to really take in the experience on her own. In episode 2, Daenerys claims to have no memory of her birth. Therefore, her title Stormborn means nothing to her. This actually foreshadows the events of the season. The element she was born under is no longer relevant, and now that she's returned home, she's more fiery than ever. During her meeting with Varys, right as she's about to deem him untrustworthy, you may notice that Daenerys wipes her hands as she addresses him. This is literally addressing the phrase, wash my hands of the matter, as if to say she wants nothing to do with him. This episode also shows the return of Arya's beloved pet wolf, Nymeria. The last time we saw Nymeria, Arya was forced to chase her off into the woods to protect her from Cersei. Now she's a massive alpha, running her own pack. When Nymeria declines the offer to rejoin Arya and leaves, Arya responds with, that's not you, which is a direct reference to something Arya herself once said to her father. When her father told her of a life she could have as the lady of a castle married to a high lord, she replied with, that's not me. For co-creator David Benioff, the CG and special effects aren't what make a scene, it's the actor. 
He praised Macy Williams for her remarkable performance in the scene with Nymeria, crediting her for bringing the whole scene together with her final expression in the close-up. The scene in Stormborn in the Chamber of the Painted Table was considered to be rather progressive in the eyes of the show's writing staff, as there aren't too many examples in history of television in which several women are discussing power, strategy, and war. Although it wasn't their original intention to make a feminist statement, once they saw the potential, they embraced it. They tried to emphasize each woman's domineering ways while raising the stakes of the conversation. Like with the plan to invade Casterly Rock, D.B. Weiss believes that the Chamber of the Painted Table scene wouldn't have been an interesting scene if it were a group of haggard old lords discussing plans of war. The female aspect is what made the scene, and it was a lot more fun to write. Upon meeting the Red Lady Melisandre in the throne room, we learned that the prophecy foretells of a chosen prince or princess. However, considering neither John or Danny completely meets the mark, many fans speculate it could actually mean a prince and princess. Jorah Mormont is diagnosed with grayscale disease and is given six months before he loses his mind. In order for the visual effects team to apply the prosthetics that created the look of the infection, actor Ian Glenn had to arrive on set at 3 a.m. That's five hours earlier than anybody else. Five extra hands worked on the set that day who were in charge of overseeing pus for Jorah's wounds. Every time John Bradley West removed a section of the prosthetic for the procedure, the visual effects guy would pump the pus through the opening. Ugh. Gross. Samuel claims to have studied grayscale in a book of rare diseases written by Archmaester Pylos. This is a reference to the character Pylos, who was a maester in the books that served Stannis Baratheon at Dragonstone. Episode 2 features a pivotal moment for the character Euron, who finally proves that he's a real threat when he invades Yara's ship with his ship, the Silence. The crew had just a few weeks to shoot the Silence battle sequence of Euron's invasion on Yara's ship. There's tons of action and lots of special effects and CG, but all the producers cared about was nailing the actors' close-ups. As a result, this scene was carefully crafted by director Mark Mylod to mostly revolve around the three key characters, Euron, Theon, and Yara. The scene's primary focus was originally centered around Yara, until actor Pilo Aspect caught the director's attention with his charismatic performance. The staff described the sequence as being so much more fun when centered around Euron. <laughs> When writing the silent ship battle sequence, the creative staff had to consider Theon's actions during the chaos. Initially, they had considered the character to be completely over his traumatic past as Ramsay Snow's personal servant, but then they realized that it should come back to haunt him and affect his decision making with the scene. Since fire is still one of the hardest effects to replicate, the visual effects team preferred using real fires for the silent ship battle sequence. To add to the effect, they created ember guns which shot out fire embers from above. In that same scene, you might notice Euron's men are cutting off tongues of their enemies. The practice is mentioned in the books and done to prevent mutiny. Ilaria and Yara's romantic scene, for the most part, was improvised. Yara's actress said it wasn't directed that we would kiss. It just seemed like something we should do. We let it very much so. It was meant to be a suggestion of flirting, and then it became more sexual than we expected because it seemed right. There was also a skeleton crew working because the rig could only take so much weight, so we were left very much on our own. And who wouldn't want to kiss Indira? I mean, come on. In the episode The Queen's Justice, fans finally get to see the highly anticipated meaning of Jon Snow and Daenerys face to face. This symbolizes the beginning of the end as the two stories merge, becoming a true song of ice and fire, as author George R. R. Martin had intended. The energy between Kit Harington and Amelia Clark during the scene was so intense that the entire film crew found themselves lost in the moment, including the show's co-creators. Just so we're clear, film and TV sets are notorious for being boring, and yet the entire crew was captivated while filming the scene. The two meet in the audience chamber, which was built by Aegon Targaryen strictly to intimidate visitors. But before Jon can even step foot inside, he sees Drogon, Viserion, and Rhaegal, so above Dragonstone. Clearly Daenerys was trying to send Jon a message that she's someone who should be feared. It may have been their first time meeting on screen, but Kit and Amelia have actually been good friends since they met at a hotel bar in Belfast before the first season started filming. So the epic meeting scene may have been electrifying for those on set, but for the actors it was a unique and challenging experience to know the world was watching two people meet for the first time, who have actually known each other for years. The most interesting aspect of these two characters meeting is the very different perspectives that they have toward each other. Here are the two key heroes of the story and yet Jon refuses to bend the knee to Daenerys because he doesn't know or trust her judgment, and Daenerys looks at Jon as some ignorant bastard with made-up stories about the dead. According to Michelle Clapton, the chain Daenerys is wearing here represents a lesser version of a crown, and was meant to reflect the eagerness she displays in receiving the actual crown. The Siege of Casterly Rock scene was about highlighting how the invasion goes contrary to expectations. To illustrate this to the audience, Tyrion voices his plan as the scene plays out, at which point Jaime's hidden strategy is revealed, giving the Lannisters a leg up on Daenerys. Instead of a pointless battle, 
battle sequence, the scene focuses on Jamie marching up to Elena Tyrell to confront her about the invasion. They cover the outcome of the battle in just a few words. When Elena asks if they fought well and Jamie responds with, as well as could be expected, it hints towards the fact that the audience didn't miss anything. In the books, poison is referred to as a woman's weapon, and in relation to the series, the episode titled The Queen's Justice is a reference to the poison that Cersei uses on her enemies. This also serves as a reference to Elena's final confession. The confession scene before Elena's implied death was D.B. Weiss's favorite performance by actress Diana Rigg in the entirety of the show. The loot train attack scene in episode 4 was described by the cast and crew as someone bringing an F-16 to a medieval battle. It features Daenerys unleashed for the first time as she rides her dragon into battle with the Lannisters in a production even bigger than the infamous Battle of the Bastards. The focus of this battle sequence was chosen to be from Jaime's perspective because it's far more interesting and somewhat terrifying to watch the victim of a dragon attack trying to hold together his troops while the world literally burns around him. It was also a crucial component of the scene to highlight the complexity of Tyrion's emotions during the annihilation of the Lannister army. On one end is his queen, but on the other there's his brother whom he still loves dearly. The entire aim of that sequence was to confuse the audience in the hopes that they wouldn't know who to root for during that battle. This was emphasized through Jaime and Bronn's point of views in the midst of the chaos in the battlefield, the idea being that it ain't pretty conquering, according to co-executive producer Brian Cogman. It required a keen sense of attention just to track continuity for the battle scene of that caliber. To put it in perspective, 27 wagons were used, all dressed very specifically, and the set had to be reset constantly and dressed according to the camera movement. Not to mention the various stages of the battle had to be accounted for and the various perspectives involved. Let's just say all departments really had to deliver their A-game. That also means keeping track of what was burnt, half burnt, or fully engulfed in fire for every single prop on the set. To replicate that charred look, an eco-friendly black dye was sprayed onto the props, and in later stages, ash was used to dress the set to create a more authentic look. For coverage of the sequence, a total of four to eight cameras were used, three different tracking vehicles, and two different airborne camera platforms that were able to mimic a dragon's point of view, which were also capable of movements of up to 70 miles per hour. The episode played with our emotions and even the audience's emotions when our beloved character Bronn shot Daenerys' number one dragon, which is another fan favorite character. Jerome Flynn jokes that ever since the episode's premiere, not even his mailman speaks to him anymore. Well, you shouldn't have agreed to shoot that dragon, Flynn. The crew actually set stuntmen on fire for this sequence. In fact, they set a new record for setting the most stuntmen on fire for one sequence and setting the most on fire at one time. That's 73 body burns total in under 10 days and up to 20 guys at once. As if being set on fire wasn't hard enough, the stuntmen weren't allowed to breathe at all while on fire or else they'd breathe in flames. They had to hold their breath for the entire shot, totaling an average of about 30 seconds every take. In this episode, we also see Littlefinger gift the Valyrian steel dagger to Bran, the weapon used by a cat's paw assassin in season 1 for his attempted murder. The dagger was last seen on Ned Stark's desk, but after Littlefinger betrayed him, I guess he reclaimed it for himself. During this exchange, Littlefinger mentions chaos, to which Bran Stark replies, chaos is a ladder. This is a particularly unsettling message, as it was a direct quote from Littlefinger to Varys during a private conversation back in season 3. The fifth episode, Eastwatch, was originally titled Blood of the Dragon, which may have been too on the nose for the theme of the episode, as it refers to the idea of family bloodlines, as well as Jamie's own desire to literally spill the blood of Drogon. Following these family themes, many viewers pointed out that the visuals of Jamie's drowning sequence were very similar to Tyrion's drowning sequence in season 5. Ironically, both were pulled to the shore by unlikely rescuers. Also in this episode, we finally see the return of everyone's favorite blacksmith, Gendry. The writers admit that they'd wanted the character to return for some time, but for them, it was a question of how and not why. Gendry has reprised his father's role as the Hammer Warrior. Looking back, this event was foreshadowed in the very first season when the character is introduced, hammering away in the shop. The character was so missed by fans during his absence that hysteria rose online a few years back. To calm everyone's nerves, actor Joe Dempsey actually tweeted to fans that his character was still rowing, a remark which prompted countless memes online. Since Davos was clearly Tyrion's only way into King's Landing, the writers decided that he should be the one to find Gendry because of their previously established relationship in Season 3. Dempsey's still rowing tweet had become so famous that they actually wrote it into the fifth episode. When Davos finds Gendry, he says to him, I thought you might still be rowing. As a nod to the fans, while filming this scene, Amelia Clark posted some hilarious behind-the-scenes footage of Kit Harrington pretending to be a dragon. And, you know, as of this moment, it's slowly becoming a meme. While it makes sense that Jon would finally bend the knee to Daenerys, and what I mean by bending the knee in this sense, I mean asking her hand in marriage. On the opposing side, fans believe these two represent the end of old traditions. Davos instructs Gendry not to tell anyone about his lineage, but it's the first thing he does upon meeting Jon Snow. Joe Dempsey claims that it's because he felt a connection to Jon, but still, the actor found it so 
funny that he laughed out loud when he read the line for the first time. Another interesting reveal is that of Cersei announcing her pregnancy. Considering young Cersei's prophecy as told by the witch in season 5, fans wonder if she's lying to Jaime, or if she'll die before the birth. Fans are raving at the idea that the producers have stuck a huge reveal during the quiet scene with Sam and Gilly at the Citadel. And that's the truth about Jon Snow's parents. During that particular scene, Gilly stumbles across an interesting factoid that Septon Maynard issued an annulment to Prince Rhaegar and remarried him to someone else. But she's cut off before saying any more. He married Lyanna Stark after all. And how did the fans react to this? Well, they're all angry at Sam for interrupting the scene. It's also revealed that the Citadel has a total of 15,782 steps, which has less to do with the plot, but is still pretty interesting. The hardest part about writing Episode 6, Beyond the Wall, was determining how the Westerosi Suicide Squad could possibly survive their encounter with the Army of the Dead. Gradually, the writers came up with the idea to trap them on an island surrounded by whites. It was a real back and forth effort to decide who would join Jon on his mission outside the wall. The Dirty Dozen came to mind because everyone in that group has a reason to hate each other, so it made for the most interesting dynamic. There was a subtle throwback to Season 5's The Wars to Come, when Tormund quotes Jon's own words back to him, in reference to bending the knee to Danny. Tormund reminds Jon of the cost of pride, and how it was the end of King Man's Raider. The Frozen Lake battle sequence took a whopping five weeks to shoot. The actors claimed it was like running a marathon in about 40 kilos of armor and steel. The scene was written to fool the audience into thinking one of their beloved characters was going to die. Probably a first for the show, which never fools around about killing our beloved characters. D.B. Weiss joked that, even though he co-wrote the episode, he couldn't help but fear for Tormund when he watched the sequence. Between shooting and rehearsals for this battle sequence, the group of actors bonded on set through music and the board game Risk. Apparently all the actors were very competitive, and they had to be pulled away from the game to shoot. There were so many kills in the sequence that there wasn't even time to choreograph them all individually. So instead, seven movements were choreographed for each actor, so they could whip them out as they pleased against the stuntmen, who knew how to react to each. Actor Christopher Evie claims that he follows the Rocky Balboa method from Rocky IV to get into the Tormund mindset. Apparently that includes a lot of downtime in nature and chopping wood and whatnot. You know, wildling stuff. Richard Dormer, who plays Beric Dondarrion, said that they used real fire on his sword, with zero CG enhancements. He even had to make an effort to move the sword 20% slower so that the flames wouldn't go out during filming. In order to hold an active flame for two minutes, Beric's sword prop weighs three times as much as a regular sword. The actor describes it as more of a club than a sword. According to George R. R. Martin, Beric may be resurrected six times no less, but he's no longer alive. He's just as dead as the Whites, and the plan was for him to become less and less human over time. At Comic-Con a few years back, when asked what he'd like to see happen in the final season, Dormer said that he wanted to see Beric and his flaming sword on the back of a dragon. Oddly enough, his wish came true a season early. For the actor's next prediction, Dormer claimed he wants Beric to fight one of two people, the Night King or the Mountain, although he felt like he might have a better chance facing off against the Mountain. Yeah, the Night King didn't turn out so hot. The white that the Hound carried through most of the sequence was no dummy, that was an actual guy up on his back. Supposedly, Rory McCann injured his knee during his sudden stop on the lake when the ice first started to break. When John emerges from the icy water after the battle, the direwolf pommel on Longclaw seems to open its eye. This supposed detail caused an uproar of new theories on social media. Unfortunately, all of the theories were debunked when episode director Alan Taylor admitted he had no idea what people were talking about. As it turns out, the eye was just frosted over and it cleared off once John splashed water onto it. The showrunners love to mess with their fans' emotions. The most fun they had in this episode then was teasing that all of the good guys would get away scot-free, only for the Night King to come in and take down Viserion. They planned this twist because they knew the emotional impact it would have over the audience. The writers decided to bring back Cold Hands Benjen because he worked with the scene's compressed time frame. His face alone provided the emotional connection that they needed to convince Jon Snow of his next move. The final deciding factor behind Benjen's return was that it felt like the most sad satisfying way to end his storyline, while justifying his life's purpose to the audience. Many fans voiced their confusion over the time span of the episode, including questioning how fast Gendry ran back to Eastwatch, got a raven to Dragonstone, and summoned Danny and her dragons up north. Director Alan Taylor admitted that the chronology is a bit hazy, but felt that it shouldn't be the main concern for the audience. If it makes detail-oriented fans feel better though, Taylor did say that Twilight Beyond the Wall is much longer, so the Jon Snow Suicide Squad's wait for Danny could have been much more than standard night. Fans can't help but wonder why Cersei's hair had been kept short ever since it was shaved off in season 5. Many believe it's symbolic of her progression to power, now that she resembles her father Tywin, outfits and all. This season has been repeatedly targeted by a group of hackers that refer to themselves as the Mr. Smith Group. The group stole 1.5 terabytes of footage from the company's servers and were ransoming it for 250,000 bitcoins. The hackers leaked episode 4 of the season and threatened to leak the season finale as well. But Balls of Illyrian Steel HBO claimed that they would not pay the ransom nor play their games. Because of the delayed schedule this season, 
season, the showrunners claim that fans may not see season 8 until 2019, but we'll have a better idea of the time frame once the showrunners complete the production schedule. In our season 6 fact video, we mentioned all of the spin-off possibilities that HBO is considering for the show. Screenwriter Jane Goldman, who's involved with the potential series, has now claimed that it could be based on an event that we're all familiar with. So. Could it be Robert's Rebellion? The Fall of Valyria? Let us know in the comments below what you think. A little bit after the sixth episode of the season aired, an image circulated around the internet showing a truck in the background of the White Walker sequence. Many thought this was a mistake during filming. However, it was debunked immediately after, explaining to everyone that it was actually from Inside the Thrones and not the actual episode. In an interview with Michelle Clapton, it was revealed that Daenerys' white fur coat seen in Beyond the Wall was meant to mirror Viserys and the clothing he wore in season one. Fans, however, found it to be an homage to Viserion, the dragon she lost in that same episode. While not particularly noticeable in the show, Viserion was described as cream and gold in the books, similar to Danny's white fur coat. While on the topic of Daenerys' clothing, you can see that she's adopted the look of House Targaryen, red and black. A lot of the clothes she wears throughout the season reflect her Targaryen lineage, and similar to her white fur coat, the shape is a callback to the shape of Viserys' clothing in season one. One of the major themes of this season, according to D.B. Weiss, is character arcs and changes of heart. The dragon and the wolf embodies that theme most of all because all the main characters are changed in some way by the events of this episode. The Dragon Pit sequence is referred to as the scene of the season, but it's also dubbed one of the most essential scenes in the entire series. It was very complicated to film. The scene took several days because there was an exhausting amount of character coverage they felt was absolutely necessary. Since most fans already figured out Jon Snow was actually a Targaryen and rightful heir to the Iron Throne, that made it challenging for them to present this info in a new exciting way. As an added element to this reveal, they decided to intercut the scene of Jon and Danny with flash flashbacks of his parents' wedding to literally illustrate the information bomb they're about to receive. The writers have been very mindful contrasting every season and scene, so while last season ended on a triumphant note for Danny, this one is much more horrific and hopeless for everyone. This epic season finale end scene had been planned for many years now. The creators knew that the only thing that could penetrate that wall and let the White Walkers in was a dragon. A dead dragon. Now the bigger question is, is it breathing blue flames or ice? This video was written and edited in real time as the episodes premiered, and is the first and only video to be done this way by Cinematica and Frederator. Once again, I I'm Adrian and thanks for watching 107 Facts about Game of Thrones Season 7. Who's your favorite character this season? Comment below and let us know. Don't forget to click the bell icon to become part of the notification squad. And subscribe to Cinematica, where we help you watch smarter.